Hey folks, and welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. Today we're taking a look at the Sennheiser HDV820, and I want to start off by saying a huge thanks to Sennheiser when they sent me out the HD820 headphones, not to be confused with the HDV820 amplifier and DAC here. When they sent out the HD820 headphones, they were kind enough to send me this with it. Now I didn't actually end up using the HDV820 in my testing of the headphones, so I didn't mention it there, but I had this sitting here and I was keen to get around to trying it to see what it could bring to the picture. Years and years ago with the original HD800s, I remember trying the predecessor of the HDV820 here and being kind of somewhat impressed. It didn't blow me away. So I came into this review expecting it to be a nice, solid piece of audio engineering, but not really expecting that much more. And I have to say, I've been really, really impressed with what I've heard and what I've seen. The design of this device to me is almost as impressive as it sound, as we'll get to in a minute. But before we get there, I should mention that the HDV820 here is a DAC and amp kind of all in one. It can be a preamp as well, and it retails for about two and a half thousand US dollars. So it's not a cheap piece of kit, but I absolutely think you're getting what you pay for, as I'll detail in a moment. Before we get to that detail though, it's probably worth taking a bit of a look at the unit to give you a sense of what's going on here and its size, because one of the things that I first noticed about the HDV820 is just how long it is. And now that I look at it, also the way it collects fingerprints on the black surface here, so sorry about that, but it's quite a long device. It doesn't take up a huge amount of space in terms of its height and its width, but it is quite long. So I just wanted to flag that, but for now let me give you a quick look at the HDV820, and then we'll talk about its specs, its features, of course how it sounds, and what it's like to use. <laughs> Feels like the first time Throw away all my pride Don't want to say I love you first But holding it in just might make me burst Love in the open Daydreaming hoping Melting in heart Whispering winds bring the remembrance that you're my girl. When you look at the specs on the Sennheiser website, there's not a huge amount of information about what's going on inside the HTV820, and because I don't own it, I haven't pulled it open to check for myself. But what I can tell you is it's using the ES9028 Pro chip from ESS, and it's capable of decoding DSD up to 256 and PCM up to 384 kilohertz. Beyond that though, there's not a lot of information there, so whether it's discrete, whether it's integrated design of the amplifier, the exact power output's not there, it's very limited what it tells you on the website about the specifications and the technology going on inside. The good news though, is you kind of don't need to know, because all that matters is how well it works and how good it sounds, and on both counts, it's pretty solid. Before we get into the sound though, let me give you a quick rundown of what is on the front and the back of the device, because this is a real key for me with the HDV820. This is one of the most enjoyable devices to use that I've come across in a long time. And the reason I say that is for two things. One of them is it's been kept wonderfully simple. It just does what it needs to do. There's no extra bells and whistles. There's no fancy interface, no fancy displays. It's just a very easy to live with, easy to interact with device. And then part two is that it does everything you need it to. Not only is it a DAC, but it's also a headphone amplifier that's going to take various analog inputs, but then also a pre-amplifier should you need it to send the signal back out to other devices too. So let's look at how that works and how it's been maintained absolutely seamlessly through a very simple interface. Moving along the front of the device here, we've got a power button. That's just a power button, nothing else. We've then got our headphone outputs, including a 6.3mm connector, a 4-pin XLR, and a pair of 4.4mm balanced outputs. So one of the things about this amp if you want to, is you can connect multiple headphones all at the same time and just leave them plugged in. I can't say that's the way I tend to use devices like this because I don't like hearing other headphones playing when I'm not using them, but it's something you could do if you wanted to, or of course if you had multiple people using the same amp. And that's of course assuming that they're using headphones that require about the same volume. Moving on from the headphone outputs though, and the next thing we have is a very simple input selector knob. And so this is just a very simple rotary knob that's going to very easily and smoothly move you through the different inputs available. 
And what's key here is that this is giving you access now to digital inputs like USB, optical and coaxial, but also into the analog outputs if you just want to use this as an amp, both balanced and single-ended. And I absolutely adore the fact that everything is accessed through that single control knob. There's nothing else you have to worry about. You switch it on, you choose your input, you turn up the volume and you listen. And it makes it a very easy device to live with. Finally, on the front panel, we've got this lovely large control knob with a wonderful feel to it. Everything about the Sennheiser HDV820 just feels quality. It's a lovely, lovely device to live with. If we swing it around to the back now, on the back, and I've probably given away pretty much everything you're going to expect to see here, but on the back, things are relatively simple. We've got our analog inputs over on this side. We've got XLR and RCA. So as I said before, they're selectable via that control knob on the front. You can use whichever one of those you want. You can have different devices feeding in and switch between them. There's also a little gain adjustment dial here that's adjusted with a flathead screwdriver. And it's unusual to have that here and not on the front as a gain switch. But again, it's part of how this device maintains its wonderfully simple interface. And then as we move on from the analog inputs, we then get to our digital inputs. Some will see the HDV820 as being quite limited, but I kind of see it as having everything we need. It doesn't have any of the extra kind of higher quality AES or I2S type inputs, but you've got everything you need in terms of USB, optical, and coaxial. From there, we move on to our analog output, and there is probably one thing to think about here, and that is that there are only XLR outputs if you're using this as a preamp, so unless you're adapting it, it's not going to be great for many of the tube amps out there that are single-ended only. You're going to need a pair of XLR to RCA adapters if you want to use it that way. But if you're looking to feed this to an external headphone amp that is balanced, then this has got you covered. And then finally, of course, we've got our mains power socket there. So this has a full-size mains cable going into it. And so just to recap and finalize what I'm saying here, what I love about the HTV820, and I've probably made it clear already, is that it's simple, but it's very versatile. It doesn't have any extra bells and whistles that you don't need, but it's got everything that you do need and possibly then some. Now I'm saying things that you do need and don't need. That's obviously up to you what you do and don't need. I guess what I'm trying to say here is it's got all the basics covered and it covers them really, really well, particularly because everything is so simple to access. During my testing, I was able to have this hooked up with a USB cable from my computer for the testing of the DAC and then a different digital source coming in from my DDC into the coaxial connection, DDC being a digital to digital converter. And then I was also able to take an output from the Cord Hugo TT2 and feed that into the analog inputs and then run an output from here into my powered monitors so I could jump between the monitors and the headphones if I wanted to. But that probably does bring up one little issue where there is probably one thing missing from this in its quest for simplicity, and that is that it doesn't have a way to switch off the preamp outputs if you are using active monitors that you can't switch off. And so do take that into account. If you are looking to use this with some sort of powered monitor, you're going to need a way to switch them off when you're wanting to use headphones because all outputs are on all the time. So that could be good for some people, not so good for others. That's something you'd have to think about. But assuming you're happy with the functionality, the price, the general idea of the HTV820, the next question of course is how it sounds. Trying to work out what gear you should buy next? Have a look at the Passion for Sound Recommends link down in the description below. Clicking on the link will take you through to my Patreon page and specifically a post where you can click on the Airtable image to go through to my recommended product database. Once you're in the database, you can use the filter button up the top to choose which sorts of product types you want to have a look at. Maybe headphones, maybe DACs, maybe amps. Choose the one or ones that you want to see from this list. And then you can also sort the list by price if you want to, or other features as well. You'll then see a consolidated list just of the product types you want to have a look at, including things like what the retail price was when I last checked. You've got links to my reviews of each product, and then also links to where you can go and buy them. Feel free to play around with the filters and sorting options as much as you like to find the gear you're looking for, and I hope that this database points you in just the right direction for you. So happy hunting, happy listening, and now let's get back to the review. And so starting off as I normally do, just thinking about this entirely in isolation with no comparisons, I think the HTV820 sounds fantastic for the price. It's a fairly expensive unit for an all-in-one, but having come straight from reviewing the Shanling EM5, which is an all-in-one that also has streaming capabilities, there was a very clear and significant upgrade in sound quality. And specifically what I found going from the EM5 testing and then putting the HTV820 in its place and continuing on listening to that, was that I was getting a much better sense of depth in the soundstage, so less of a left-right soundstage and a little bit more depth. Not a huge amount of depth, we're not talking like a chord DAC type level of depth, but definitely more than the EM5. And also a better sense of refinement. The EM5 was strong in a sense of detail retrieval and neutrality, and all of that remained the same for me with the HDV820. It had just as much detail, maybe a tiny bit more, but the key thing was it was just all more refined. It sounded more liquid, more fluid, it was easier to listen to, but with no sense of added warmth. 
it was just a better quality delivery of the same general level of detail. And so hearing the extra sense of refinement and soundstage quality, it was clear to me why you'd spend more on a device like this from a sound quality point of view when compared to the very fully featured but not quite as good sounding Shanling EM5. A couple of other general sound quality points to talk about is that it really didn't matter what the input or the output was I was using, this sounded great across the board, it was consistent tonally from the headphone outputs or from the preamp output and regardless of what my incoming source was. And I'll break that down more in just a moment but I just want to give you the sense that it's consistent across the board that it just sounds great. And then one final thing I should add to that is it also sounded good with any headphone I tried it with. So I tried it with things like the Meza Elite, which are an easy to drive, moderate impedance planar. I tried it with the HD 820s, of course, and it sounded great with those. I tried it with the Hyperman RES Stealth, it drove those with no problem. And then I even tried it with the RAL CA1As because they're a more difficult to drive load because they're a ribbon that runs through an adapter box. I've got the review of that one coming soon, so check that one out if you want to know more about that. But the point is it's a much harder load to drive because it is going through this adapter box and the HDV820 had no issues there at all. So across the board, everything I tried it with, it drove it well, it sounded good, it's neutral enough that it doesn't have any issues with different types of headphone tunings, but because it's also refined, it's not going to punish you for bad recording, a bad source, a bad headphone pairing. And what I mean by bad headphone pairing is that with some clean and detailed amps, if you put a particularly analytical headphone on it, it's going to punish you for it. But that's not the case with the HDV820. It's neutral, but it's refined, and therefore it works well with everything. And so let's talk now about the performance of the different aspects of the HDV820. And what I mean by that is how it performs as an amp on its own with an external DAC coming in, how it performs as a DAC driving the headphone stage as kind of an all-in-one, and then also how it compares as a DAC feeding out to an external headphone amp starting off using it as an amp only, and so in this case I was running the TT2 as my source, XLRs out of the TT2 into the back of the HDV820, and then I was driving, I think it was the Elites for most of this, as I said before I tried a lot of different headphones on the HDV820, but from memory, it's not in my notes, but from memory I was using the Elites for all my actual kind of critical listening tests. One of the tracks I used while testing the amp stage was Crossing the Rubicon by Bob Dylan, and what I heard from that combination with the TT2 as DAC, and this as the amp, was just a wonderful quality sound. Tonality was fantastic, there was a great sense of articulation from the sound, so everything was clean and crisp with the leading edges of notes, but there was no harshness anywhere. There was, as is usually the case, a very slight loss of transparency when compared to a direct connection out of the headphone sockets on the TT2, but that's true for pretty much anything. By the time you take an XLR output from the TT2, feed it into a different amp, go through the amplifier and then spit it out to your headphones, there's really nothing that can maintain the same level of transparency as the almost direct connection you're getting from the DAC into the headphone stage of the TT2. So I don't expect things to compare identically to the TT2 in terms of that transparency. And what I mean by that is maintaining the micro details, the tiniest bits of texture. You do lose a little tiny bit of that with any external amp I've tried. But the HDV820 was about as good as anything else I've tried in terms of keeping it as close as possible. In terms of tonality when comparing the two, I feel like there's a very slightly greater sense of kind of richness from the HDV820 when compared to the TT2, but we're talking really, really minor. And I do occasionally find, and I've talked about it before, I do occasionally find that the outputs from the TT2, that being the headphone outputs, can be just a little bit kind of dry sounding. Sometimes I wish they were just a little tiny bit smoother, a little tiny bit richer or creamier, whatever word you want to put to it. And so in some ways, the sound from the HDV820 with that extra 1 or 2% of kind of creaminess to the sound is maybe preferable. And the key thing for me there was that the sound was still very natural and neutral, but it was also easy to listen to. It was kind of slightly refined, very slightly, I don't want to say smoothed off because that's going to send the wrong signal. It was just slightly refined, slightly kind of easy to listen to, particularly on a poorer recording or something that was a bit grating in any way. It just managed that a little bit better than the absolute honesty of the TT2 can be. And so all in all, I'd describe the HDV sound as an amplifier as very impressive. It's possibly a little bit overpriced if you're only going to use it as an amp because you're paying for the DAC functionality as well. But it's nice to know that if you're buying it for a multifunction device, you're not trading off significant sound quality if you're using the amp stage. And so, for example, if you had yourself a nice r to r DAC, like maybe a Denifritz Pontus II or something like that, and you wanted to use this as the amplifier from that, but then also enjoy the DAC from this when you want that different flavor of a Delta Sigma DAC, then what I'm saying is you're not going to lose out any of the quality from your r to r DAC running it through the amp stage of the HDV820. 
And that's fantastic. It's a really great feature to have a quality amp paired up with what I think is a quality DAC, but let's get to that now. Taking the HDV820 and running the outputs from this into an external amp being the Burston Soloist GT, what I was able to do now was compare the internal headphone amp running with the DAC inside the HDV820 with running the DAC only out of the Burston Soloist GT. And what that was showing me was two things. Firstly, how well matched the amp and the DAC are within the HDV820, but then also how well the DAC on its own is performing. One of the tracks I used for this test was Precious by Annie Lennox. And what I heard as I went back and forth was that the amplifier within the HDV820 doesn't give you quite the same sense of depth and layering in the sound as something like the Burson Soloist GT does. The GT also extracts a bit more micro detail, so you can hear some of the little nuances of sounds better from the Soloist GT than you can from the HDV820. But it's also worth keeping in mind that we're talking about a $3,000 amp and only amp in the case of the GT versus a $2,500 DAC and amp in the HDV820. So it's not a knock against the HDV820 that it can't quite match the performance of the GT. And in fact, it's probably more of a compliment that it gets as close as it does. Going back and forth between the two, I feel like one area that you can clearly hear why you might spend more on the GT is that it has a more fluid delivery. So whilst it's giving you even more detail and texture and space compared to the HDV820, it's also delivering it in a more relaxed and more fluid way. In contrast, the HDV820, and this is only in contrast, the HDV820 comes across sounding just a tiny bit artificial at times. As I said before, on its own, if you're not comparing it, it's a wonderful sounding all-in-one. But what I'm pointing out here is that if you do spend money on an external amp that is even higher quality, you can get even better sound. And the areas that that sound quality is going to improve are things like the micro detail retrieval, the sense of layering in the sound stage, and also that ease with which it's delivered. And so generally speaking, I think the HDV820 is excellent. I think tonally it's almost about identical to the Soloist GT. There's perhaps a little tiny bit more kind of upper mid-range emphasis from the HD820. And I don't mean that its frequency response is going to have an upper mid-range bump. What I mean is that its character, the general tonality and character of the sound, just has a different kind of feel to it. And it tends to make me notice the upper mid-range more on the HD820. Whereas I think the slight kind of fluidity and smoothness of delivery, not smoothness of sound, but smoothness of delivery from the Burst and Solace GT just changes the way you perceive it slightly. But they're very, very close together overall. And that's where I'm saying I think the HDV820 is a very impressive device. And so at this point, as you've no doubt already gathered, I was loving my time with the HDV820. I think at this stage, the only issue I had was that it didn't have an output switch for the line out. And so it's not great using it with active monitors that are always on. But that's about the only criticism I can level at it. But before I wrap things up there, there was one last test I wanted to try. And that was because I looked at this and thought, okay, if I'm spending $2,500 on an all-in-one like the HDV820, what else could I buy if I don't need it to be an all-in-one? And I'm happy to buy a separate DAC and headphone amp slash preamp. What else could I get for the same sort of money? And the obvious choice that I had here was the Burson Soloist 3XP. So that's not the Soloist GT that I was talking about before. It's the smaller model amplifier, less powerful, less high tech, etc. So taking the Soloist 3XP and also the matching Burson Composer 3XP and putting those two together as a stack. We're now spending about the same amount of money on both of them, although I was testing the Soloist stack with their aftermarket power supplies, what's called the supercharger. But depending on when you buy them and if you get the superchargers bundled in, we're talking roughly the same money. And so you've got the Soloist Composer stack, which is actually over here behind me. You've got it there. So it's a little bit of a taller stack. It's a little bit narrower or maybe about the same, but nowhere near as deep. Or you've got the all-in-one in the HDV820. And so this for me was the big test. For exactly the same money, if space and number of components isn't an issue, which one's going to give you the best possible sound? It is probably also worth mentioning here that in the case of the Soloist, you are getting the ability to switch on and off the line outputs. And you've also got the ability to roll op amps if you care about that. But if we're just talking about pure sound quality, which one's the better choice? One of the tracks I used for this test was I Like Birds by The Eels. And I should mention, because I just mentioned op amps, that I was using the stock op amp setup for both the composer and the soloist, meaning it's the original Burson B6 Vivids in there. Comparing the two different setups, being the HDV820 and the Burson stack, I found that the HDV820 actually comes across a little bit smoother than the Burson stack, or maybe more refined is a better word. It comes across a little bit easier to listen to, but not lacking significant detail in my opinion. The treble from the Burston stack is a little bit more textured, 
but in some ways it also sounds maybe a little bit artificial and it's going to depend on your personal preferences, what you perceive to be correct or incorrect in terms of treble, but it is also something that I've called out before with the Bursons and that is that when I did my op amp rolling video on the Soloist 3XP, I found that changing out some of the op amps did help to improve what I consider to be the naturalness of the treble. So it's an area that I do think the 3XP struggles just a tiny, tiny bit is that the treble can come across a touch artificial and the HDV820 was better than the Soloist in that regard for my ears at least. I think a part of the sense of smoothness that I was hearing though was not just in the treble, but also that the lower mids and the mid bass potentially were just a little bit fuller sounding from the HDV820. Listening from the Burson stack, it was almost like there was a slight kind of suck out through the upper bass and the lower mids. And so the HDV820 does give you a slightly sort of richer and more present sound of those frequencies, but I wouldn't say one is necessarily right or wrong, it's hard to know what's correct. Both are excellent presentations, but if you like a slightly kind of richer sound through the deeper vocals and into the upper bass, then the HDV820 does give that to you compared to the dead stock soloist stack. Keeping in mind, as I said before, you can always roll the op amps on the Burson, and if I had something like the Sparkos Labs SS3602s in the volume stage of the Soloist 3XP, things could have been a bit different. But in pure stock form, I do think there's a nice sense of body and presence to those lower mids and upper bass that I really enjoyed about the HDV820. Having said that, things don't all go the way of the HDV820 here. Because one of the things that the Burston stack does so much better is the sense of depth and layering in the sound stage. It's still limited by the use of a chip-based Delta Sigma DAC, as in like a, an ESS chip or an AKM chip, in this case it is an ESS chip, it's still limited by that, but the Soloist 3XP does pull out more of the layering when compared to the amp stage within the HDV820. And so comparatively, the HDV820 sounds a bit flatter in the stage, and also it comes closer to you as well. So there's less overall sense of space and depth in the sound stage from the HDV820, and that's where the Burson did start to pull ahead again a bit for me. And actually I shouldn't say it pulled ahead again, because they ended up level pegging for me. Where I landed after listening to all of this is it's very hard to split the two. For me, the staging is clearly better from the Burson stack. I like the sense of layering it gives, I like the sense of distance between me as the listener and where the music seems to begin, but I do prefer the tonality more from the HDV820. And I think in the perfect world, what I would say is the best option here is buying the Burson stack and changing some op amps, but then you're spending more money as well and you've got multiple boxes to think about. And so what that means is that the HDV820 really cemented itself for me as excellent value. You've got a single box solution that's wonderfully easy but also versatile to interact with, and for the price you're spending, it's going absolutely toe-to-toe -to -toe with a separate stack like the Burson's. Normally all-in-ones are a bit of a trade-off, we're not necessarily getting the best performance of DAC or AMP because it's all being sort of compromised and shoved into one box. But in the case of the HDV820, trying to spend the same amount of money and get better performance from separates doesn't seem easily possible. You can definitely get different performance, you can get maybe more versatility with things like op amp rolling, maybe some extra functions like switching off the line outputs, but I don't think you're going to hands down beat this by spending the same amount of money. And that's pretty cool, I think we've got a wonderful looking in an understated way, a wonderful looking device that's very versatile, very easy to interact with, that happens to sound wonderful, and you get all of that in a single, simple package with a single power cord. And so I am now a huge fan and a huge convert of the HDV820. I will gladly recommend it to anybody. And so I hope this video has been helpful in explaining to you why that is. Hopefully it's clarified if and how this could work for you and maybe how it wouldn't work for you. And if you have found the review useful or helpful, as always, I'd love it if you hit the like button. Consider subscribing and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave it to the music. So happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.